I once shot hoops with Steve Nash in Battery Park City. Um, uh-huh. He was just down there with his family, and I was just a dude um, playing pickup hoops with my uh-huh. friends. And I got there early, and this guy walks by in a hoodie with his uh, kids in like these <laughs> twin stroller. And I look up, and I was like, I think my exact thought was like, that dude in a hoodie is fucking Steve Nash. <laughs> is what I what I what I said to myself. <laughs> and then so this what? is an absolutely true story. Was this so while he I was get, still playing in the NBA? Or, or yeah, post? he was literally the NBA's reigning MVP at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it, was like the, it was like the MVP of the league. What? Uh, yeah, like no, wow. no joke. So like, so so I'm playing pickup with um, friends in Battery Park City, and, and I get there before my friends. Um, so I'm just there shooting the basketball alone, and then Steve Nash, reigning NBA MVP, <laughs> comes up to me and says can I shoot around with you? Like, oh, like this is the kind goodness. of thing that yeah. if you said this was in like in a commercial or whatever, you'd be like, this is total nonsense. Like this is not the way the world works. <laughs> Eventually I ended up just like rebounding for him. Cause I felt like a total <laughs> asshole being like, now I'm going to shoot and you rebound for me, Steve. I was like, Steve Nash rebounding for you. <laughs> I can't imagine that at all. I, mean, I would be just clanking everything. Alright, welcome back to Yang Speaks. This is your co-host Zach Grauman. It's good to be with you guys. It's a new day in the United States. We have a new president, officially. Joe Biden was sworn in. We're recording this on Thursday, the 21st. So we recorded this right after the inauguration. And for those of you who are not Trump fans, that doesn't mean you're Democrat or Republican. He's, you know, you have your own situation. But if you weren't a Trump fan today, feels like a sigh of relief in many ways. And it was nice on a personal level, I think, to see some good old fashioned boring politics. For those of you who haven't been tuning in, Andrew is basically going to be doing interviews um, in his schedule given his, his general political activities. And you'll be stuck with me for the introductions. And I hope to keep them interesting. I hope to keep them um, giving you the Yang perspective on what is going on in the world. Now, before I dive into it, I hope you guys like this new merch I'm wearing. It is not officially launched yet, but if you like it, give me an at on Twitter, at Zach underscore Brown, and let me know what you guys think um, as we start to build out a merch uh, platform for y'all to buy over the next weeks and months. Here's what I'd like to do on these episodes, um, because if Andrew's going to be doing conversations, you're not going to always get Yang's perspective on the news of the week and the issues that are hitting home and some of the more creative stuff or more timing, timely stuff that we do. So what I wanted to do today is uh, is three things. I wanted to give you what I, what I think are the news updates of the week and what's going on in the world, and then two, give you the Yang perspective, whether it's Andrew or myself or kind of what the Yang Yang zeitgeist is. Um, that fact-based, not left to right forward, humanity first perspective for you, and then introduce our speaker today. So I think you guys are gonna enjoy this. Let's start with the news of the week, folks. And the news of the week, the big one, a couple things. Number one, obviously most importantly, the Buffalo Bills are in the AFC Championship. And if you're listening to this, they may have already clinched a Super Bowl appearance. I don't know, I'm either crying or doing cartwheels. It's one of the two, it's fine. We're not gonna talk about it anymore, but the Buffalo Bills, Come on now, big news. Uh, second fun piece of news is Bernie Sanders is a hilarious meme at the moment. Uh, Bernie, for those of you who have not seen it, Bernie Sanders was at the inauguration and bundled up like grandpa is at his kid's soccer game, <laughs> like looking a little over it. He's been photoshopped into every sitting photo you can imagine from Game of Thrones to like a park bench to Civil War photos. And it's pretty hilarious. So kudos to you, Bernie. That's internet gold. I hope you guys appreciate this meme. Um, but more importantly, let's talk about Joe Biden and what's going on. So Joe Biden in the first 24 hours has already signed executive orders to issue a national mask mandate on federal property and interstate travel. So if you are on a flight, if you are in a federal building, you have to wear a mask. Now, for those of you who are Yang Gang here listening to Yang Speaks who are libertarian, I understand you're like, government freedoms, that kind of thing. But guys, the government requires you to wear pants. It's for the protection of yourself and others. So the mask mandate, guys, in a global pandemic, not a big deal, not an infringement upon rights. If it wasn't a pandemic, it'd be a big deal. But guys, come on, we wear a freaking mask, please, for, for everybody. The other thing he's promised, to extend nationwide restrictions restrictions on home evictions and foreclosures. So um, 
those were set to lift. He's kept them for those of, uh, for a lot of people who are struggling to stay in their home in, in COVID, they're struggling economically, people not being able to be kicked out of their home, which is a smart move to prevent uh, more homelessness. And I think there's th- ways you can compensate landlords and things like that to prevent everybody from losing money, but it is important to to think of the human side of COVID and then continue to pause federal student loan payments, which I'm in, in bit, big time in favor of. A couple of things he's done to overturn what Trump's done. He has rejoined the Paris Accords. Frankly, looking at the Paris Accords, it's kind of fluff, um, but it is a good symbol that climate change is important. So I don't think that hurts or harms many things, but I hope that we prioritize climate change because I like this planet. I hope you guys do too. Um, he's ended the so-called Muslim ban on travel that Trump started in 2017, restricted travel and immigration from a number of countries to the US. Though so those countries included Syria, Iran, Iraq, Sudan, Libya, Somalia, and Yemen. Um, and he's included a couple others in 2020. That ban is lifted. We do have no- normal travel restrictions around COVID, but he's lifted that back and it was a pledge he promised to do and he has done it. Um, and he's expected, if he hasn't signed it yet, he has signed an order to rescind the permit for construction of the Keystone Pipeline between US and Canada. Uh, very controversial policy, particularly for environmental and climate change activists. And I don't think Canada is thrilled about that. But um, generally speaking, the international response to Joe's presidency has been strong for what it's worth. His also plans um, that he did promise on the campaign he hasn't done yet, but it looks like he will do shortly is to rejoin the World Health Organization, propose an immigration reform um, for the 11 million undocumented immigrants um, and give them a roadmap to citizenship. He's planned to do a lot on climate change to achieve 100% clean energy energy, net zero emissions by 2050, transgender rights and the Equality Act, um, and a number of things um, in the, the COVID recovery space, which he's promised. So those will be coming down the pipe for you to kind of keep an eye out for, if you will. So that's what's happening. I will give you this in the Yang reaction. This is where we're thinking, guys. Um, we have a great relationship with Joe and Kamala. I got to know Kamala's team in particular during the presidential run at a number of the debates. Their staff was always um, very great to work with um, and, and fun. Joe's team, we got to know after, uh, after we got to know more after we became a surrogate for Joe after we dropped out. Um, I will say this: the relief packages that are coming down the pike and being proposed better include cash relief. They better include cash for Americans. And if that doesn't happen, Andrew will say what needs to be said when the time's right. Let's put it that way. He's like the worst politician ever, which I love. Um, he's human. Um, and so when he sees something wrong, he speaks He speaks up about it. When he sees a big idea, he speaks up about it. Not worrying about the polling, the political risk. You see it all the time. You see it, you just follow him on Twitter. You see that. And But right now it's important to support Joe and Kamala. They have a massive burden on their shoulders, the weight of the world on their shoulders. Uh, there's no global recovery, recovery without America. We need to lead here. We need them to lead. And so um, we will follow their lead and, and speak up if, if we need to. Last thing I'll leave with is, is an introduction to our speaker. So we have Kevin O'Connor on as an MBA analyst and expert, um, normally with The Ringer. For those of you who don't like the NBA, I think it's still worth a listen because um, they don't just talk about sports. They talk about leadership, management, big decisions. I love when Andrew's talking about stuff that's not always politically related because you can't see how his brain works in a human setting and you can kind of get a sense of how he would govern and what his priorities would be and how he acts as a regular guy. So I hope you all enjoy it. It's one of the more fun ones. I enjoyed it. Um, Kevin's a fascinating guy. So tune in now, folks. Kevin O'Connor joining Yang Speaks. Now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks. I should be on his podcast. That would actually be cooler. One of my favorite NBA journalists, someone who I've learned a ton from about my favorite teams and my not so favorite teams, Kevin (laughs) O'Connor. Welcome, Kevin. Andrew, thank you so much for having me on. How are you doing this weekend? I am doing great. I'm doing better than this country. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. (sighs) Yeah, it's a rough time Mm. in the, the good old US of A. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're, we're here to talk about, uh, something that hopefully gives us all, uh, a bit of relief, um, which, which is your day job. And Kevin, I got to say it's incredible, uh, because if you imagine all the legions of young sports fans out there, so many of them dream about doing a job like yours. And I'm sure you've told the story in other environments, but how the heck do you get a job writing about a sport that most of us 
uh, essentially follow for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's something like I always wanted to work in sports somehow when I was a teenager. I'm 30 now. And, you know, I was like, maybe it'd be cool to be a sports agent. I wonder how you get on TV, but I never really knew how to do it. And then when I was 23, my dad recommended I just sign up for an internship at Comcast Sports at New England, now NBC Sports. They have those all around the country. And, I applied for that. I remember the interview was like all questions about the Red Sox starting lineup and their pitching rotation. I'm like, I can do this. This is easy. And then it just sort of snowballed from there over three years to get hired at the Ringer and the last four years here with the Ringer and Bill Simmons. And it's been, you know, beyond a dream come true because it's something I always imagined and dreamed of doing, but didn't know how to do it. Um, so I feel very, very fortunate to do what I do. It's, it's a lot of fun to, you know, make connections with people doing it. So did you uh, write about sports during like high school and college? Um, you know, I did some like writing contests in local newspapers and like in my fantasy sports leagues that I used to play in. I used to do like fake articles. So like, I have always liked writing and always liked storytelling. And I look back at that time and it's like I was getting reps writing stories about my fake fantasy teams rather than write, you know like writing on forums and stuff about the celtics i grew up a boston celtics fan very spoiled as a boston sports fan growing up um and you know what i was always getting reps always getting reps and i guess that helped me once i started as a blogger um covering the celtics and then expanding doing a lot of nba draft stuff um so it's always something i like just never really you know knew how to chase it and once i figured that out it sort of started a roll Geez, man, because your boss, Bill Simmons, I feel like is the godfather of Boston sports bloggers turned big time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the rest of it. So so when when you were uh, like at the New England Sports Network, uh, you know, you were producing articles like how do you get, quote unquote, discovered by the ringer? Because I, I feel like um, that's a very big call up. You know, so I, I don't know for sure, but I've been told by multiple people at the ringer over the years that they like the NBA draft guide that I did. So starting in 2014, I started making NBA draft guides with my top 100 scouting reports of all the prospects that were entering the draft. I did that in 2014, 2015, and 2016, all by myself. And then the ringer noticed that and they're like, oh, we could bring this guy in to do some draft stuff for us. Um, so it started out and with them noticing that rather than the stuff that I was actually doing specifically covering the NBA and covering the Celtics at the time. Um, but I think the draft is what got their notice. They noticed me with the draft. And then from there, they looked at my other stuff and like, hey, he's young and raw, you know, bring him in and maybe he'll improve. Over we could work and- with this guy. We could mold him like <laughs> yeah. a, the lump of clay that he is. Um, so uh, so at that point, did you move from uh, Boston to California? Uh, no. So I stayed. I grew up in Brockton, Mass. my whole life. Brockton, Massachusetts. It's like 45 minutes south of Boston, home of uh, Rocky Marciano and Marvin Hagler. Grew up here and uh, I moved to L.A. in January of 2018. So about a year and a half into working at the Ringer. And then I was there until my dad got diagnosed with cancer in March of 2019. And then I was home about half the time until last December 2019. And I've been in Brockton for all but a couple weeks since then. Um for last year and a month. Uh, so I'm, I'm in my childhood bedroom right now recording this, actually. Get the <laughs> green screen behind me in my childhood bedroom here with my mom now um, in Brockton. I'll be back in LA at some point, though, I hope, post-pandemic. Well, I, I'm, I'm so sorry that your family has been struggling uh, in, in that way. I mean, I, I hope you and yours are all right. Uh, it's been a really hard time for different people in different ways. Yeah. Uh, but I know, like, uh, for me, I'm a bit older than you, but my father uh, turned 80 one uh and so like at any point in time you you like try and appreciate uh family and the time you have yeah no doubt about it it's um you know i wrote a article on the ringer a couple months after he got diagnosed just about you know enjoying the moments and you know cherishing everything you have with the people that you care about and the people you love and you know the, the pat like I, I feel like my life in many ways both in good ways and bad ways has felt unreal you know, with the good, with like getting hired at the ringer, having this dream job, talking to you, <laughs> you know, the bad as well with my dad, you know, getting diagnosed with cancer and passing away after 11 months, my mom having heart open heart surgery during that, like that, none of that feels oh, wow. real. And then the pandemic and now everybody is going through some sort of, and with everything else that's happened, some sort of what feels like unreal. It's not something that you imagine happening in your life. And I think that more than anything else uh, shows how important it is that you 
you really do have to just cherish the moments that you have with the people you love because nothing is guaranteed in life. Like nobody exempt from good or bad things yes. in life. And, and that's really the mindset that I, I really try to have in my life every single day, when, whether things are good or whether things are bad. Um, so that's really helped me personally, you know, with losing my dad. Um, and I, and I, I hope a lot of people, you know, going through all this crap we're going through this year with the pandemic and the amount of loss we've had. Um, I hope people are able to, 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 to find a little bit of, you know, joy with the people they care about um, throughout a year like this. I, I hope so too, brother. I really appreciate it. Uh, everyone appreciates it. Uh, and uh, what, like what a time you and your family uh, have been going through. Let me ask you guys, you listen, it's like, Someone asked me this the other day, and it's, it was really helpful. The question is this. How's your mental health? Like, how you doing? Hanging in there? Because COVID sucks. Like, there are days, weeks, where I just don't leave the, the apartment. I don't leave the house, wherever the heck you are. It's brutal. Um, and I find at times, if I don't handle, if I don't approach this intentionally, I, my mood gets a little shorter, my attention span gets shorter. It's brutal. One of our sponsors is really important to, to us personally. Is, it's called BetterHelp. H-E-L-P, better help. And it's basically online mental health resources, um, personalized ability to communicate with someone to, to help you navigate not just COVID, but anything going on in your brain. And I've seen this, like I was just talking to my, my youth pastor um, from home and he's like, we're seeing anxiety in kids. Like, you know, like my middle schoolers are way more anxious. Everybody, we're all dealing with it, man. So better help is really cool. So you can start communicating under 48 hours, sign up, bang, get your personalized counselor. Um, it's not a crisis line. It's, it's not even self-help. It's professional, professional counseling done very securely online. Um, so you can send a message to your counselor anytime you get timely and thoughtful responses. And I've done this. You just get somebody to talk to. It's all confidential and convenient, professional, affordable. If you want to start living happier, getting your mental health right, as a listener, you get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash yang. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang. So you probably grew up a Boston sports fan, I'm guessing, growing up right outside. Sure um, I'm, I'm going to unpack for you um, my sports allegiance stories just so we can level set. Uh, and then I brought you on so you, we can talk about my hometown teams, um, the Knicks and the Nets, and I can learn something from from you. And I actually remember the first time I think I saw your work was the NBA draft guide, and it was probably the ringer. So, uh, you know, like the, the, the ringer is like, oh, he's really great at <laughs> Well, the Knicks are always seem to be up. drafting high, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it too. I mean, like, I would love to hear what you think of the young players. Um, you know, uh, on right now, the the Knicks have more young players on, than the Nets. But I grew up. Uh, I was born in upstate New York, but I grew up in a suburb of New York City, and became a hardcore Knicks fan during the Ewing Knicks era, which might have been a little bit before your time. Um, so it was like the early '90s, and the Knicks were always uh, competing very hard, but then losing to the Jordan Bulls. So this was Patrick Ewing, Charles Oakley, John Starks, Anthony Mason, uh, Derek Harper, that crew, uh, Doc Rivers, um, losing to Jordan, then breaking through in the finals when Jordan uh, left to play baseball, <laughs> and then losing to the Rockets on the John Starks horrendous two for eighteen shooting performance. Coming back in 99 with Sprewell, loved Sprewell, uh, losing again to the Spurs. Uh, and then things get really, really rough. Uh, Jeff Van Gundy leaves, and then uh, and then the culture takes a very, very south turn. But I was a fan even through the lean years, the Isaiah Thomas years, the uh, Eddie Curry years, the like you name it. Um, and then Lynn Sanity struck, and it was like the greatest time to be a Knicks fan uh, or a sports fan uh, that mm. I can still remember to this day. Those are good days, uh, good times. <laughs> yeah, like so. Uh, I mean, at that point, um, uh, it seems like you were uh, just getting started. But what what were your reflections on Lynn Sanity? It was just special, you know. I mean, special. I mean, like him going, you know, Harvard here, you know, nearby. Um, it was great to see a, a young player come from that school. It was great to see an Asian American shine in the NBA. And that was, I mean, I had friends in school at the time that were like, oh my goodness, 
there's an NBA player who's Asian American and Jeremy Lin, and they had fun. Imagine watching that being player. an yeah. Asian guy who plays basketball, seeing that stuff happen. I was like, this is like the greatest thing ever. Plus, it's your hometown team. It was the greatest time of my my sports life. It was great, and you know, and like just like never mind like all that as well. Like just from a pure basketball standpoint. He was incredible. He had clutch moments. He scored from everywhere around the court. It was a memorable time at, for the Knicks, and it felt like that was one of those moments of, as a sliver in the last 20 years where it's like, oh, my goodness, this team has a chance to be really special. And I was never at Madison Square Garden for any of those games. I think I've only went to two or three Knicks games in my life. But the atmosphere atmosphere over there was great, even when they were losing. I can't imagine what it's like in that building with you know a packed crowd when the team's good. Uh, have you been to games like that on those moments? Did you go to any Linsanity games? Uh, I did go to a Linsanity game. Uh, I was in the garden for Larry Johnson's four point play. Uh, you're right that the atmosphere in the garden was good, even in bad times. Uh, like uh, I was first in line for, you're not going to believe this, but MSG had $10 nosebleed tickets for Knicks games uh, in the very late nineties, uh, like, uh, when I was a law student between 96 and 99, I would go and get $10 tickets. So the atmosphere was always great. But then at the apex, like during playoff games or during the insanity, it was electric. Yeah. It was the greatest. <laughs> uh, and, and so at the end of that season, when we let Jeremy Lin go because of money, uh, I, mm. I just could not handle it anymore. I was like, this is the franchise that paid Jerome James 25 million that paid, <laughs> that paid Isaiah Thomas like millions for, you know, sexually harassing someone like, for, like, or, like the, the, it, it was just too much. Uh, and so at that point I threw in the towel and I said, look, I I've been, uh, li eating, sleeping and breathing the Knicks, uh, since I was a kid. Um, but dumping Jeremy Lin for money, uh, like w was just like too hard for me to bear in part because when he was um, taking the world by storm, it was like the, the greatest period of my fandom <laughs> and then seeing it disappear uh, uh, in that way. Uh, like I, I just uh, was so, um, so hurt really. I, Cause I thought like, look, Jeremy Lin might not become like perennial all-star and the rest of it, but I was very confident that it was going to be our story uh, and the fact that it then became like the Houston Rockets yeah. <laughs> story. Um, so so that was like a real change in my relationship uh, with the Knicks. And since then, there haven't been a lot of those stories to cling on to either. It feels like it's been missed draft pick after missed draft pick, you know, missed free agent after missed free agent. And it, it, like now is really the first time where we're at now with the Knicks where it's like, okay, Things are developing. I have not felt good, like right? I've missed anything since. <laughs> <laughs> since uh, and it's been like better for my mental health too, yeah. because uh, you know, and and like I have real problems with James Dolan, like him banning Oakley, him banning that fan. Yep. Like it, it's really like the opposite of the kind of uh, team you want to root for. And so during that time, uh, I was kind of an NBA uh, homeless like fan, where I was like, okay, I'm I'm going to break up with the Knicks now, uh, and then. A few years later, the the Nets brought on Jeremy Lin, and I was like, done. Like, I'm going to be a Nets fan. So I, I, I went to Nets games. Um, I actually saw Jeremy again in person when I was there. Uh, and later, I became friendly with Spencer Dinwiddie um, and other folks who are associated with the Nets. Um, so I became a Nets fan. Um, and I don't know how many Knicks fans had to – wrestle with any of these feelings over the last number of years. And I did keep up with the Knicks, but I'm just going to rattle off like a few of the highlights and then we'll get into what's going on now. Um, the the bright spot of the last number of years of Knicks fandom was clearly Chris Tapps Porzingis. You know, he gets drafted, overachieves like the unicorn. Um, uh, he's putting up numbers and highlights. I mean, he has some, you know, health issues, um, but he's a gamer. Uh, and then we trade him away for... Uh, cap space, Dennis Smith Jr., a couple late first round draft picks, and you're like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> if you were if you were a Knicks fan, being like, well, at least we've got uh, Porzingis, and then he gets traded for a bag of chips, uh, and the the bag of chips then ends up uh, evaporating into thin air because you can't sign anyone with the cap space. You know what that that trade Phil Jackson making that I I am still willing to bet that he partially made that trade because of a lack of trust that Porzingis can stay healthy at all 
And so he's cashing in, getting some draft picks, right or wrong. That's my belief that that was the logic, part of the logic behind that trade. And with KP now in Dallas, I mean, he hasn't really stayed that healthy. Like that's the one major concern with him. But ultimately, for the mix, for the Knicks to make that move at the time, they lost the guy that gave them hope. That was the one player that you looked at and, and felt like there's a potential of building something around this guy. And you know what? Hopefully for them, with those draft picks they got back from Dallas, they're able to turn that into something. It's just there's not a lot out there right now. And KP is going to come back and he's going to thrive next to Luca. Yeah. So if you're a Knicks fan, and this would be my big beef um, uh, as someone who who's continued to follow the team, is like it's been hard to identify someone that you can root for that you think is going to be there. <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and anyone you do kind of emotionally invest in, the person disappears. Um, so I, I I said last year I was like I think this is the darkest time I've ever seen as a Knicks fan, and then some Knicks fans actually like t- took issue with me. Um, but but I, I was like, look at least before you kind of could tell if you were trying to compete or trying to build or whatever. But like this team, they use their cap space on a bunch of one-year contracts for a bunch of vet mercenaries who are going to need playing time because you don't sign a one-year deal and then say, like, say, sure, I'm, I'm cool, like coming off the bench. And, and then you had these kids who were there trying to develop uh, and it wasn't clear whether they would actually be played over the vets, like based upon just, you know, like like their ability to perform on the court. So I was like, this team has like no direction at all and is going to have terrible chemistry. <laughs> and, and, and some folks like came to me and were like, oh, you're being too hard on this team. And I was like, this team's going to be the worst. Um, but But then now they seem to have turned a page. And this is, I guess, what, what we can get into now is like the new regime. Um, as someone who covers the NBA, do you uh, develop any contacts or relationships with like uh, like any of the um, the folks they bring in in terms of um, coaches and GMs? Is that like something that um, you get exposed to? Yeah, definitely. And I don't know anybody you know high up in the Knicks front office. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with Leon Rose or or World Wide West. Um, but like when it's kind of funny, like being in it now since 2013, like I mentioned earlier, it's funny seeing people who were like lower in organizations at the time when I first met them now growing higher in organizations and maybe someday become GMs or some may already have become GMs. And it, it's just cool to see those relationships develop on, on their side. Cause like they're, you know, quote unquote, league sources or front office executives that, you know, but they're friends sometimes at the end of the day in certain cases. And it's great to see people's profiles rise. And with the Knicks, from my understanding is with Leon Rose and World Wide West and the guys there is, is that that's a smart group. Uh, I, Leon Rose, when they hired him, he's somebody that, I I would trust in that role as general manager. I think the connections that they have and their mindset about how to build up a team bodes well for the Knicks. And with Dolan, I mean, he's not a good owner. He's a very bad owner. And some of the decisions that he made are quite despicable over the years. But one of the things I will say that could work in New York's favor is that Dolan is pretty hands off when it comes to allowing the front office to do the decisions that they want to in the past that has led to some very bad decisions because it's been the, been the wrong people in place making those choices. But if Leon Rose and that crew know what they're doing, at least they're going to have the leash to do what they want to do to build this thing out. And some teams that can't be said where owners are involved in every single decision that's made from a basketball standpoint. So for the Knicks, they definitely are trending up. I'm not so confident they're going to keep on winning games this season uh they still are bottom 10 uh, def- uh offense so far this season their defense has really carried them some of that is opponent shooting luck some of it is definitely better effort um but they're gonna drop games at some point over the course of the season like all young teams do um but overall the team and the organization are trending upwards because of the development and the flashes that we're seeing from the young guys and as well as the hires in the front office so you know for knicks fans you know, there's reason for optimism for sure. Finally. (laughs) Uh, So two things you can say positively about James Dolan as an owner. Number one, he'll stay out of your way after he hires you. And you're right. Like that, that actually has gone very negatively for us (laughs) (laughs) because he's like brought out people who made some bad pros and cons. (laughs) Yeah. And number two, he's willing to spend, um, like, uh, like the payroll hasn't been an issue unless it's Jeremy Lin, unfortunately, but <laughs> the payroll hasn't been an issue and, uh, he, and he's willing to pay top dollar for um, management. I forget what he paid Phil Jackson. It was something crazy. Uh, 60 million, something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was insane. like 60 million. Yeah. I can't remember. It was crazy. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but so so those two things count in his favor. And if he hires the right people, uh, I don't know Leon either, but I do know people who know him. And by all accounts, he seems like um, uh, like a smart guy. Um, and Tom Thibodeau uh, seems great. I know like uh, I associate Tom Thibodeau with like the last real era of Nick greatness um, when he was under Jeff Van Gundy. Uh, and like I'm a huge Jeff Van Gundy fan. I'm now um, friends with Stan Van Gundy and Tom Thibodeau seems like he's from the same general um, coaching tree. Uh, and his teams seem to overachieve. I mean, he plays people hard, but they win. Yeah, they win and they try hard. And that's what we've seen with the Knicks so far this season. That's the big, the, been the big differentiator between this season and last season is I think more than like any system changes. You know, we're we're seeing them do some different things, especially with the way they're utilizing Julius Randle on the offensive end. But defensively, a lot of it is just straight up effort. You know, like it, it, can, it can just be <laughs> contributed to that. Hard. Yeah, and <laughs> and that, a lot of that comes from Thibodeau and the mentality that he instills in his teams and the way he empowers guys and really pushes players to try their hardest uh, it hasn't always worked out for him it didn't in minnesota with cat there it didn't even you know it worked a bit with jimmy butler that was a pretty good team and i think that's what you you know have to hold on to it's about building culture this season like like i said the knicks are going to end up in the lottery i'd be surprised if they made the playoffs in the east i know a lot of knicks fans would be angry at me oh, for saying on, man. that i think but, 10 you know, teams make the playoffs i mean that's a pretty low bar this time Sure. <laughs> hey, I mean, you never know. You know, Julius Randle could keep putting up all star numbers. He certainly looks better than ever before. But ultimately, for the Knicks, this year is not about whether they make the playoffs or not. It's about the progress that they make and showing that they're a competent franchise. Showing that you're a competent franchise is what's going to make a player want to go play for you, a star player. Whether, like, we saw this with the Clippers. The Clippers had a nice, you know, gritty young squad that fought, and then Kawhi and Paul George wanted to go there. The Lakers had Brandon Ingram and Lonzo Ball and all this young talent, and LeBron James saw that as a destination that was worth going to. And with New York, if they can put themselves in that same category that the two LA teams did just recently did and show that, hey, you know what? We got RJ Barrett. We got Mitchell Robinson. We got a lot of young talent. And guess what? If you join us, you can win now. That's what the Knicks need to become and get another draft pick and hit on that. Um, It's about progress and showing that they can be a team that's worthy of winning uh, like they haven't been the last 20 years. New sponsor alert. I think credit scores suck. There's no context to them. And it's a brutal way to evaluate whether or not someone's going to return a loan. There are plenty of people that are gonna be really reliable who don't particularly have great credit for a number, thousands of reasons. So I wanna talk to you about Upstart. It's a fast and easy way to get a personal loan to pay off your debt. And that personal loan can be high interest debt to credit cards, to personal expenses. And a half a million people have already used Upstart to get this simple fixed monthly payment. And what they do is they use more than your credit score. So they have AI and it's like, what, 1,700, 1,600 plus data points that they use on your life and who you are to see if they can get you more credit. So I love it because it's flexible. It's very human. Um, it's, it's a better way to lend and better way to borrow. And so they find smarter rates with trusted partners because they assess more than just your credit score. So you get this five minute online rate check. You see your rate upfront for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. That's your range, pretty cool. You can receive funds as fast as one business day. So it's really fascinating. Find out how to use Upstart and how it can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash yang. That's upstart.com slash yang. Don't forget to use this URL and let you know we sent you. So the loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, your income, and certain other information that you provide in your loan application. You are loaning money, so be smart. Check out upstart.com slash yang hope you guys find it interesting like we did so julius randall has been putting up monster numbers uh and and there's an interesting thing about this team i mean you really have to attribute it to coaching because it's a lot of the same players <laughs> like they're, they're back um knicks fans did not like julius randall last year <laughs> like, rightfully like, uh, so last year is, is is my sense of things i mean last, last year's team was not an easy uh team to root for um but now knicks fans are looking at julius randall thinking like wow this guy is a monster he's like putting up west brookian numbers um he he's um like 
handling the ball, making really sweet plays and passes that you're like, wow, Julius Randle could do that. Like, like there are times where if you watch some Julius Randle highlights, uh, you think you're watching like some combination of like a bigger Westbrook or like e- even I'm, I'm imagining. Uh, so this is the name that I, I know this is not the right comparison, but like I, I've seen him make some like Magic Johnson type like passing big man uh, plays and looks like <laughs> not, not like Showtime Lakers, not like I mean you know I mean like I'm exaggerating a little bit, but yes. like but there have been a lot of plays where you're like wow I didn't know that Julius Randle uh, had that kind of vision. Uh, so do you think that Julius Randle's current level of play, uh, well, first, what has Thibodeau done to like elevate his play, if anything? Um, and two, do you think it's sustainable or, or not? I think Thibodeau's done a couple of things with Randle. He's sort of using the Bam out of bio playbook. And with what Miami has done with Bam, they're letting him bring the ball up the floor after defensive rebounds. They're feeding him the ball in the high post wing area near the three-point line and allowing him to make decisions. So part of it is the offensive usage for Randall, putting him in positions to be a playmaker. The other side of it, you got to give credit to Julius Randall here. It's pretty clear to me watching his game that he – recognize the fact that he was just a turnover machine. He was a black hole at times with the ball in his hands in recent years throughout his entire career for that matter. And you're seeing now anytime he gets some defensive pressure, whether it's a help uh, or a full on double when he has the ball in the post, he's looking to pass right away. And he's doing that in transition, doing it in the half court. And that's the big difference between this year's Randall and past versions of Randall, he's always had a bit of a playmaking instinct. He's just leaning into it more, and that's encouraging to see. I'm not so sure if he's going to keep up the shooting numbers. He's still turning the ball over nearly five times a game. Like He's probably at his best when he doesn't have as large of a role like he does right now. But I'll tell you what, Randall's a guy I've been critical of. When I did my NBA draft guide years ago and him, I did not love Randall as a prospect for a lot of the reasons Knicks fans weren't happy with him last season. Defensive effort, defensive focus, you know, playmaking instincts, all that. But we're seeing the version of Randall that a lot of people who liked his game thought he could eventually realize. And you know what? It, it's It's encouraging. It's encouraging to see this because now it's about – doing it over a long period of time and showing that this isn't just a a flash. It's not an aberration that this is his new reality. And if it is, that could be a player that you want to keep around. It's so wild. I'm actually going to be say like, I'm a Julius Randall optimist. Like I I feel like if you've like discovered, you can do this kind of thing (laughs) against against these teams. Like I, I think he ends up having like a, you know, really stellar season, maybe not quite at this level, but like, I think he's going to end up, um, uh, having a great year. Um, so I'd say right now, Julius Randall, like he's probably the most important Nick on the floor. Um, but the most important Nick in terms of the future, uh, is RJ Barrett. Uh, and you just said something that really just blew my mind, Kevin, um, which is that you track these players when they're coming into the league as draft picks. And then you kind of like see their evolution, um uh, and so like there's almost like no we we should give you some kind of nickname (laughs) so you're evaluating them when they're prospects then you see them in the league Uh, rj barrett's easily the most important nick because you know like the hopes of the future number three draft pick uh star potential where are you on rj barrett rj's progress year one to year two is encouraging You know, I think we're seeing the 25 plus point scoring explosions that you wanted to see more often as a rookie from him. And that's good to see. I think the defense has gotten better. Uh, The spacing has gotten better for him to get to the rim more often. Ultimately, though, his upside is going to come down to what level does his jump shot actually reach? In the most recent Knicks game that we saw as of recording, he missed a ton of wide open jumpers completely wide open jumpers and that's a concern with him what level can he be as a shooter because you know as i mean i hate to always just harp on shooting but that's the most important skill in today's nba regardless of position having a reliable jump shot can be the difference between being an average player who doesn't get minutes and being a a quality rotation player every night can be the difference between having a being a quality rotation player and being a starter between being a starter and an all-star And with Barrett, that's what's going to determine what level he reaches. And with him, we've seen glimmers of what looks like somebody who can be a franchise player, the second best player on your team. But I think in all likelihood, he's probably that third guy. 
unless that jumper, you know, reaches the level that it needs to. But I'll tell you what, though, like he's still only 20 years old. And that's something to keep in mind. He is super, super young, and there's no doubt that there's raw talent there. Jimmy Butler, you know, who Tibbs helped develop in the past in Chicago, wasn't even in the NBA at the time. He, he was he was not. So Barrett needs to be given a lot of time. But still, that jumper and the development of that skill is is more critical than anything else because everything else, you can see a path towards it, uh, him being very good overall. Were you high on R.J. Barrett uh, when, when he was drafted? Yeah, uh, I had him ranked second, I believe, behind Zion, ahead of John Morant, which could end up a mistake. Um, but I tend to it would lean towards the bigger guy, uh, with her, which RJ is, rather than Ja at the time. I would rank Ja ahead of him now at this point. Um, but I still believe in RJ and becoming a really good player. Yeah, you know, RJ has shown a lot of professionalism. Like he, it does seem like he plays hard. He's got a good work yeah. ethic. There's no reason to think that he. Uh, won't work at his jumper. And, you know, if his jumper becomes even league average, I think that opens up a lot. Uh, so so this is going to be fascinating because the, the Knicks roster is replete with lottery picks of, <laughs> of oh, kind goodness. of like un, 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 <laughs> uncertain uh, um, prospects. Um, so after R.J. Barrett, uh, it seems like the most promising young player is probably Mitchell Robinson, who is like a second round pick. So, you know, he's kind of found... Uh, found money, <laughs> if you will. Um, are you a Mitchell Robinson fan? At this point, for sure. <laughs> I mean, his <laughs> shot blocking is so fun. How can you not be a Mitchell Robinson fan? Like, it's so fun to watch that guy, the defensive end of the floor and the rim running with his explosiveness around the rim. He's fun to watch. I mean, the reason why he wasn't a first round draft pick or a highly regarded guy uh, out of high school um he did not go to or play games in college was really just because about feel for the game and, and his ability to read the floor and that's what he's he, what he has needed to work on in his three years in the nba and he's someone who's got a lot better uh, he's probably not going to be like a you know a 35 minute per game guy in his prime years but already he's averaging nearly 30 you know and he's a starter and it, it's going to be nice to see him develop under Tibbs with more time together because Tibbs is the right coach for for getting him as good as he can possibly get on the defensive end of the floor. So much of development is about situation, isn't it? It's about, you know, whether it's basketball or no matter what it is you do, sometimes it's about having the right person by your side to help guide you along. And for Robinson, he's had, he's gotten better. And now he has a coach who is known as a defensive guy. So this can only be good for him in his career and his own personal development. So what do you see as a ceiling for Robinson? Uh, starter on a good team? Do you think that's yeah, a ceiling? I, I think starter on a good team, you know, a guy who gets near 30 minutes per game. I, I don't see him as like a, a star level player, you know, but I still see him as a starter on a good team for sure. I mean, if not that, you know, an energy big coming off your bench, which is still very important in any league, in any team. He he is fun and he does make uh, freakish plays <laughs> essentially yeah. every night. Like you're like, there's one block where you're like, wow, that was, he didn't even seem to be near that guy. And then like, um, oh, yeah. he, he made it happen. Blocking three point um, shots and everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I love yeah. that too. Like blocking, uh, blocking threes, um, like uh, seems somehow more special. Uh, so a lot of Knicks fans, I think he's probably like the biggest litmus test for the last number of years is Frank Nilakina. Um and so so that Frank. was a weird one where I think <laughs> Phil Jackson um drafted him and then was like fired immediately. <laughs> so so everyone's like looking around like like, okay, that makes sense. Let the guy who you're about to fire make your lottery pick. Um so so then Frank is out there and uh he seems very strong defensively and makes the right play. Um, but to your earlier point about shooting being the most mm. important skill, like his, his shot seems uncertain, but he's also very young. Um, and it, it seems like international Frank Nilakina is like a different animal than, <laughs> than, than, than NBA <laughs> Frank Nilakina, which, which spoke earlier to just really bad coaching, but like now he's got a, a good coach in Tibbs. Um, I, you know, I'm wondering like, what do you think of Frankie Smokes? I mean, I, I've loved Frankie Smokes for a long time. I always defended him on, on my show, The Mismatch, that I, I, I host on Tuesdays and Fridays with The Ringer. My co-host, Chris Vernon, and I have gone about gone back and forth about Frank Nilakina a lot over the years because he's somebody who, even right now at 22 years old, I'm like, if he just gets a jumper, 
He's got the defensive ability to be a player. Knicks fans know. Knicks fans know that Nilakina is already one of the better guard defenders in the NBA because of his size and length and strength in the court and intensity and mindset that he plays with. He can play D at a high level. Again, it's really just about what level can he reach as a spot-up jump shooter and how much better does his ball handling get so he can be a secondary creator for you. Like you said, he tends to make the right decisions on the floor. It's just about can he create to be in a position to make those decisions? And these are basic things, dribbling and shooting. (laughs) But ultimately, (laughs) for some guys, it takes a long time to develop that. And I I wouldn't be shocked if Frank Nilakina is a quality rotation player on a championship team when he's like 27 in five years. It just wouldn't shock me. Some guys, the developmental path is not linear. Some guys, it takes a lot of twists and turns. And for him, it wouldn't shock me one bit if that's the path for him. I still believe, but it comes down to the jumper. I have this strong feeling that Frank Nilakina is going to be a quality rotation NBA player on a team that is not the New York Knicks. <laughs> wouldn't shock me so, one bit. He's barely like, playing. Like a, under Tibbs, like doesn't it kind of say something that Tibbs' defense first coach isn't giving a lot of minutes to Frank Nilakina? That's probably doesn't bode well for Frankie in uh in New York right now. Yeah, that's discouraging because I I like Frankie too. Um, the other recent lottery pick, um, which I think there were some like measurements that were very very negative on him, was Kevin Knox. Uh, and Kevin Knox, he's in the rotation. He's, he's, it seems like he's one of the first guys off the bench. Uh, what did you think about Kevin Knox as a prospect? And now raw prospects coming out of the draft, he was going to be a project. Yeah. And and he was the youngest player, I believe in, in his draft that year in 2018. And all, all that's still true now, isn't it? Still raw, still, still a guy who doesn't look ready to play. And what a shame it is now in year three, how you look at the Knicks and their offense right now how much of a difference a quality wing scorer would make on this team. Like I said, they're a top 10 defense right now. They're a bottom 10, bottom 10 offense in the league. Having somebody like a developed Kevin Knox would make this team look totally different when it comes to projecting them forward. But ultimately his shot has not come together in the way that it needs to. Neither has his ball handling nor his decision-making. And with him, he looks like another one of those guys where it wouldn't shock me if in his second team or his third team, he ends up becoming a quality NBA player. We've seen this developmental path so many times over the years, and that's going to be the interesting thing for the Knicks because with guys like Knox, they're probably more valuable to the Knicks as a player to trade for somebody who can come in right away and bring something to you because people I talk to around the league still look at Knox as somebody who could pan out. It's just a matter of the fact that his value has dropped significantly since he was a lottery pick just a couple years ago, and now it's just a straight-up project. I want to talk to you guys about public goods because sometimes when I shop, you buy a brand or you're looking for a dish detergent or you're looking for a soap or looking for whatever it is, and you're like, is this actually good for the environment? Like, is this actually... like? Where does this stuff come from? That's where Public Goods comes in, which is why we like them. This episode is brought to you by Public Goods. It's a one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. So that's everything from coffee to toilet paper to shampoo to pet food. Public Goods is your new everything store, and it's thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. It's kind of concerning, like, where's this stuff coming from? So for rather from buying from a bunch of single-product brands, you can get it all in one. I feel good about buying it because I know it's coming from a good place. There's a membership model to keep your costs low because a lot of these like types of products can be super expensive. So you're getting more savings that way. And you can make your first purchase without an obligation. So if you don't like it, you don't have to be stuck in like a monthly membership situation. So we worked out an exclusive deal just for Yang Speaks podcast listeners, which I love doing. So you receive 15 bucks, $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. So basically just 15 free bucks to so try something out, guys. They're so confident you're gonna love this stuff. And I'm pretty confident that too. Public goods, we negotiated, they're just gonna give you 15 freaking bucks to spend on your first purchase. So you have nothing to lose at all. Just try this stuff. Go to publicgoods.com slash Yang. Use that code Yang at checkout. P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash Yang. Receive $15, 15 bucks off your first order. Just try some out. I'm going to touch on 
uh, the main player we got for Chris Stapps Porzingis, Dennis Smith Jr. He was also a lottery pick, had a really good rookie year uh, in Dallas, or at least good year counting numbers. I mean, I know there were problems with him. <laughs> he got a lot of playing time and put up some numbers. Um, his highlight reel is a lot of fun. I remember when the Knicks first picked him up, like, uh, you know, someone sent me like his highlights and I was like, ooh, like, you know, okay, like, like the dunk. highlights. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah. 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 He's, he's, he's got athleticism. He has gotten minimal playing time, I feel like, uh, in New York. Um, where is the league on Dennis Smith? Not very high on him. The, the, the size, he's very small, doesn't have a big body, the decision making, the shot selection, defense, there's a lot of, you know, factors working against him in terms of being a quality NBA player at this point. He's one of those guys who is going to have to change who he is. I, you're going to have to see Dennis Smith Jr. over the years take on a more playmaking first mindset you know, grinding on defense mindset rather than being the person that he was ever since he was a little kid playing basketball as an explosive, you know, score first, you know, spark plug guy on your team. He's going to have to change himself. And that's something that may never happen. It's something that he's going to have to do by himself. Um, And I mean, it's just kind of funny, like all these names we're listing with the Knicks. It's like so many guys that people loved coming out of the draft that they were super high on is what they could become. And the Knicks have a lot of the kind of really castaways. It feels like a roster of castaways and, and some of them are going to stick. Most of them probably won't. Uh, Dennis Smith Jr. I, I don't feel great about him. Nerlens Noel too, another castaway, a guy who was a top lottery pick who hasn't had the career people expected. You got to hope that the other big, they just drafted Obi Toppin. You have to hope that he's going to be able to stick around and has a, it's been an iffy start for him so far. Yeah, so they they both had, um, I think, some injuries. But have you gotten any early sense of either Obi Toppin or Emmanuel Quickly? And I got to say, Emmanuel Quickly has uh, one of the coolest so names. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, how how could you not succeed with a name like Quickly and be like <laughs> Quickly for three, Quickly to the basket, <laughs> Quickly loses his man. You know, did you, did just, you like, see Tom uh, Thibodeau using the Quickly pun recently with one of his post game answers? That. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Tom, Tom, Tom Thibodeau loved that one. He was chuckling at himself. But uh, with Toppin, <laughs> yeah, like like Toppin, he's only played one regular season game. So let's you know we're not going to overreact here with him. He's an older prospect. Um, played a number of years at Dayton, and he's you know got similar qualities to a, a player Knicks fans probably don't want to hear a lot about and Amari Stoudemire because the Stoudemire era did not go well in New York. I uh, you know I will say as a Knicks fan uh, for part of that time. Um, like I look back fondly on Amari. I mean, you know, his his he had his like knees had problems and yeah. you know, like the length of the contract was a little long, but like one of the most fun teams um I was just talking to another NBA journalist who said like the two most fun times covering the Knicks were Linsanity, obviously. Um and the beginning of the Amari era, yeah. uh, pre mellow trade. It was like Gallo, Wilson Chandler, Ray Felton, Amari. <laughs> like that was actually like a really, really fun team. <laughs> Anyway, so um, so I, I I can see the Amari Obi Toppin uh, comparison. Yeah, the the dunking around the rim, the explosiveness, the ability to do some stuff off the dribble with the size that he has, and Toppin shoot can shoot threes at at least an average level. With him, it's going to be about defense. He was a poor defender at Dayton, did not move laterally well at all. Um, not a rim protector around the rim either, because even though he's tall at six eight, six nine, he doesn't have the length or or the ability to really alter or block shots at a high level in the way that you need a rim protector to do. Um, But ultimately, there's no doubt that there's talent there from him. The thing that's going to be really interesting for the Knicks over the course of time is that with Toppin, one of the other players that they were really into around draft time was Tyrese Halliburton, who went to the Sacramento Kings and has really shined there, already making a lot of winning plays. He's going to succeed in a big way, yeah, for sure. He'll be in the league forever. (laughs) And and, and you know what? Like The Knicks made their choice on Toppin, may very well turn out to be a good player, but Halliburton was one of the other players that I've been told that they were strongly considering. And Halliburton already off to a great start. I wonder if we'll look back at some point and say, well, maybe the Knicks should have drafted him, as we will with a number of other teams that had an opportunity to draft Halliburton. But I guess I see the the mindset they went with. They went with Toppin with their first pick, and then they went with Quickly 
with their next one quickly being that guy in that role off the bench, you know, at six, three with a six ten wingspan who brings energy for you, brings shooting, brings secondary shot creation. So rather than drafting two of those guys, they drafted the one of them in quickly with their later pick. And already he's looking impressive already. And with him, the main question people had about him before the draft was with the size, you know, can he develop into somebody who runs your offense more to me? I'm not sure that matters. Like, he is who he is. He can run secondary pick and roll a little bit for you, handle the ball a bit. But the main thing he does is just bring energy and intensity. He changes the game in that way. And hopefully he can get better over time, more than he already is. But I I like what the Knicks did in the draft. I like what they did in the offseason, for that matter. I think they have built what could become a competent-looking team. And already they're winning some games. It's just a matter of continuing this and continuing to play with effort. Quickly is definitely a gem in the late first round because realistically, a lot of these late first rounders don't stick. uh, And it seems like quickly is going to contribute. So that's like a huge win. That's already a feather in the cap in my mind of of like the um, Leon Rose team. Uh, So I'm enjoying some of the vets that the Knicks brought in. I think most of them are on short term deals. Um, and, And I'd say like the biggest confusion for Knicks fans right now is uh, like, again, what does this team look like in a few years? Who do they invest in? If there was like, you know, you had polls for Knicks fans, you know, a month ago, it'd be like Julius Randle is going to be gone by the time, like, you know, like, like, (laughs) like, but now Julius Randle, like might be a keeper. But then if Julius Randle's a keeper, then you look around and being like, like does Obi Toppin and RJ Barrett make sense on like a Julius Randle, like a lead squad and Mitchell Robinson, like the, the roster has some, decisions to be made um but i'm really really enjoying um austin rivers like like that dude just seems like a nick he's like you know just show up in like a positive way like uh um and alec burks like out of nowhere like seems like you know he he, he's performing like the the random nick cast off veterans um seem more fun somehow than they did last year by a lot nerland's noel i actually kind of like nerland's too like uh you know i mean it, like Nerlens had that freaking, I think it was an offer from the Mavericks that he turned down for like, uh, I mean, I don't want to bring this up for any, you know, <laughs> Nerlens. No, 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 I, I think he like turned down some contract. That was worth tons I mean, of Nerlens could be a listener up. of Yang Speaks. It's possible. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Nerlens, if you're listening. That was a lot of money. But like, but didn't he turn down some like multi like yeah. tens of millions of dollars? Turned, turned down a big contract on. and then ended up getting not nearly as much as that. But this team, you know, I, I really appreciated Austin Rivers' quote about, and I think you referenced this in, a, in your podcast. It's like, look, I've been on bad teams and this team has a different energy and spirit to it. Like as a fan, that's actually like a magical thing to hear because, you know, you've been through the doldrums and you're like, oh, wow, like this isn't the same old Knicks. It's like actually kind of exciting. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I do feel like the big question is like, what does this team develop into who ends up becoming like a real fixture? Um, because that's been a real frustration over the last number of years is like you don't know who's going to be around for sure and and like you said there's decisions to be made and all these pieces don't fit perfectly and that's what's going to be so interesting to see over the course of time what does leon rose in this front office decide to do and which star players become available obviously this season has thus far been defined by james harden james harden wants to get out of houston i'm not convinced harden's going to end up getting traded I think that the Rockets have a good group, John Wall, Christian Wood, even guys coming off the vents like a Jay Sean Tate, who's been an awesome energy guy for them. My understanding is that, and I have this in my article in the ringer this week, you know, it comes out Monday after we record. And um, there's a lot of people around the league who sense optimism increasing in Houston, that they'll be able to keep Harden around. He'll be content staying there. And if that's the case, who's the other star player that could get traded that a team like the Knicks could theoretically throw their name into to try to get into and I, I look at bradley beal from washington the wizards stink they're two and eight as of recording they have a bottom defense uh their offense is horrible when beal's not on the court russell westbrook looks like a total shell of his former self the role players have not been good to me the wizards look like the team that's kind of on a path towards blowing it up and with beal he makes sense for a team like the knicks to cash in on some of those draft picks that they got for Chris Stapps, Porzingis, and their own picks, and maybe some young, young, some young players as well, because Beal's only 27 years old. He still fits the timeline of an R.J. Barrett and the other young guys on the Knicks, and he's young enough and well-liked enough around the league that maybe somebody else would want to join along and play with him. Like, if you if Leon Rose gave you a call later today and said, hey, 
What do you think about going for Bradley Beal? Is that something that you would be in favor of for the Knicks? I mean, of course. <laughs> you know, like, right, right. Right, right now the Knicks are still looking for building blocks, and like you know, like like to to me, Bradley Beal, like the odds of the Knicks getting Bradley Beal based upon what could be traded for him seem pretty low to me. Like because I feel like if Washington made Bradley Beal available, like every contender would be like the freaking oh, yeah. Nuggets could put up like a much superior offer. To anything that the, the, the Knicks I mean, I, I wouldn't favor I wouldn't favor the Knicks in like the Beal sweepstakes, but I I think like they're the type of team that. It makes sense. Like I said, this year about the Knicks is all about appearing to be a team that's competent. I, I feel like it makes sense for them to throw themselves into that to show that they can be in there in the race for those star players. And that's something that can set a tone and draw attention to the team that, hey, these Knicks are different because they are different. And so they need to show them themselves to be different. So I, I think about it from a strategic point of view for the front office and ownership too. They They need to make players – and other teams around the league and agents feel like they are they are ready to bring on a proven talent because that's ultimately going to be the goal here. It's not just developing young players for the next eight years. It's going to be about finding the right star through a trade or free agency. They need to be positioned for that, and they're on their way. And Beal might be the next guy. They might not get him, but it's about being ready for whenever those opportunities become available. Wow, spoken like you're whispering into Leon Rose's ear. <laughs> uh, that was uh, that, that, that was a that was a tremendous summary. Uh, well, I got to say this Knicks team is a lot more rootable than they've been in years, uh, and uh, any fan is excited just to be able to watch a team that you can enjoy um, because the team has been been tough. Um, yeah. So I now have a big ask for you, and I don't know if this is something you can do. But do you have the power to switch your Madison Square Garden background into a Barclays background? Yeah, yes, you do. Look I at was this. ready. <laughs> oh, ground floor of Barclays. The Barclays Center. I, I came it's fantastic. prepared. <laughs> Dude, look at this. Everyone, you should admire Kevin's uh, <laughs> diligence. I mean, geez. So now we're going to talk about the Brooklyn Nets, my team. Uh, like, you know, I've, I've, um, I actually was one of their guests, uh, for, um, during, uh, the bubble play where like, I, I showed up on like their, uh, their video yeah. wall, <laughs> That's right. like, you know, I, I went to an in-person game right before they shut down and the people in Brooklyn were very nice to me. Thank you, Brooklyn. That was a blast. Uh, so this season started with so much optimism. The optimism's still there. I mean, the Brooklyn Nets, like, uh, you know, could represent the East, like, you know, like they, they could contend all year. Uh, but this team was stacked starting the year. Like you, you start out and you're just looking at this rotation being like, wow, they go 10 deep. Uh, they're they're going to score. <laughs> I mean, I think there was one game they won like 144 to 140. Like the, the, the team could just uh, score on anybody. Uh, they were uh, veteran. Like we just got through the Knicks and like all of like the, you know, like, like uh, lottery picks and whatnot. I mean, the Brooklyn Nets are a totally different animal where it's just like veteran – um, contenders. Um, and then Dinwiddie went down and this is really like the, the, to me, and you, you look at it and you say, well, this team still has plenty of talent even without Dinwiddie. Um, but then after Dinwiddie went down, like they've had a real rough patch. Um, they, they had, you know, Kevin Durant had to, uh, sequester because of some kind of COVID contact, which shouldn't be a long-term thing. Um, Kyrie Irving missed a couple of games uh, for personal reasons that, you know, like no one really uh, knows much about. <laughs> we're we're mm. just like, like, not even Steve like Nash. Just, <laughs> yeah, we're just like shrugging and saying, uh, um, Steve Nash, um, Steve Nash, like, uh, first, let me say I root for Steve Nash because he seems like a great guy. And I, I, I once shot hoops with Steve Nash in Battery Park City. Um, wow. He was just down there <laughs> with his family, and I was just a dude um, playing pickup hoops with my wow. friends. And I got there early and this guy walks by in a hoodie with his uh, kids in like these twin <laughs> stroller. And I look up and I was like, I think my exact thought was like that dude in a hoodie is fucking Steve Nash <laughs> is what I, what, I, what I said to myself. What? And then so this what? is an absolutely true story. Was this so while he I was get, still playing in the NBA? Or, or yeah, post? he was literally the NBA's reigning MVP at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it, was like the, it was like the MVP of the league. What? Uh, yeah, like no, wow. no joke. So like, so so I'm playing pickup with um, friends at Battery Park City and, and I get there before my friends. Um, so I'm just there shooting the basketball alone. And then Steve Nash, reigning NBA MVP, <laughs> comes up to me 
and says, can I shoot around with you? Like, oh like this is the kind of thing that yeah. if you said this was in like in a commercial or whatever, you'd be like, this is total nonsense. Like, this is not the way the world works. <laughs> um, but this totally happened. Yeah. Like, I, I think oh, I no. have like, I have friends who then showed up and saw me shooting around with a random and then they were like, uh, huh. And then they recognized more like, <laughs> like WTF. Uh, and, and I, I will say also that Steve Nash shooting around randomly on a basketball court in, um, in, in New York city, um, he doesn't shoot around like a normal person. Now, what do I mean by that? Like he wasn't shooting like jump shots from various places. He was just shooting really weird, like off balance, one footed leaners. Where he would like, like come in and he'd be like leaning back where he was like sort of almost like, uh, you know, almost like parallel to the ground. And like lead. It was like he was practicing getting his shots get, off yeah. with like seven footers flailing around all, uh, all around get, him. Getting reps on those weird shots against, you know, common men <laughs> who are under six feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just standing there being like, oh, be my guest. Uh, eventually I ended up just like rebounding for him because I felt like a total oh, asshole awesome. being like, now I'm going to shoot and you rebound for me, Steve. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know what I mean? like, Steve Nash rebounding for you. <laughs> I can't no, imagine I mean, that he at was, all. I would he was be such a nice guy. Everything. Yeah, I bet. Oh yeah, that's the other guy. thing. I immediately became nervous and started bricking everything. But yeah. <laughs> he was like a nice enough guy where he was uh, rebounding for me, and I was like, "This is like against the laws of like nature that <laughs> Steve Nash is rebounding for my shitty jump shots right now." The so basketball I will gods frown places. upon you, Andrew Yang. <laughs> Today's program of Yank Speaks is brought to you by Athletic Greens. With all the things going on in your world, it's, it's kind of difficult to maintain natural or effective nutritional habits and give your body what is actually needed to thrive and execute. I'm moving into my apartment. I've, I've been here, but it's like this ongoing moving process and kind of busy. And one of the first things I packed was Athletic Greens because I love this stuff. I put it in I just, every day, I just throw it in some water and, and pound it. And it's this daily all-in-one superfood powder. One scoop of this stuff's got 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients, including a multivitamin, a multimineral, probiotic, green support, a green superfood blend. It's like those green smoothies you got with like way more vitamins and really, really healthy. And it fits all the diets. So those of you who are like, I'm keto, I'm paleo, I'm vegan, I'm dairy-free, I'm gluten-free, whatever. Fits it all. Check the box. No big deal. So right now, Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. They're offering our audience a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So visit athleticgreens.com slash yang. Join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world. Um, and join us as uh, someone who's making a daily commitment to better health every day. So that's athleticgreens.com slash yang. We've got Kevin O'Connor back to talk about the Nets post Harden trade. So we were talking about the Knicks and the Nets, and then this colossal trade came down the pike. James Harden is a Brooklyn Net. Kyrie is back from his walkabout. The Nets (laughs) (laughs) have had real ups and downs on the court. Harden triple doubling, doing his thing. They dropped two games to the Cavs. Kevin, first, let's talk about this trade. Brooklyn Nets, I mean, they're going all in here for sure. Four first round draft picks and four first round pick swaps for James Harden. Like, what was your initial thoughts, uh, like from, from a fan perspective, when that deal went down? So I, I had two thoughts that were in opposition to each other. Um, the first is, wow, you've just given your entire draft future. Like, I don't, I don't even think I've seen like that number of picks and swaps. Uh, very, very extreme. And you gave up two of my favorite players from this uh, this roster, Jared Allen and Karis LeVert. Uh, and they were they seemed like good spirited guys, young guys with upside. They both were kind of uh, developed by the team. Um, so all of that's heading one direction. But then on the other direction, you have an MVP who wants to come play with your MVP. And uh, that's about it. <laughs> you, know, you, you look at it. Well, well, didn't Jared Allen himself say it? Would you do the trade? Yeah. <laughs> I believe Tari and Prince also was asked the same question. And he said, yeah, I would do the trade. <laughs> so even the guys themselves in the trade would do it. And understandably so. I mean, it's bittersweet to give out those guys that are part of, you know, when Allen and Lavert is part of those fun, gritty Nets teams with Kenny Atkinson at head coach the other couple years back. But 
I mean, this is a trade you do a hundred out of a hundred times, it's even despite this, you know, kind of a up and down start we've seen from them. Uh, I felt the same way. It's like, you know, I mean, it just boils down um, um, the, to who has the best player on the court. <laughs> and if you have like the two best players on the court or maybe three, uh, if you include Kyrie. Um, so then Kyrie comes back and I got to say, um, you get these really positive young thunder vibes from Kevin Durant and James Harden and then Jeff Green, who a lot of people forget about, but he was like a very high draft pick who played on those thunder teams. Uh, and they, it seemed like there was some really good chemistry and camaraderie and they came out and like Harden had the, this epic debut and they were like doing their thing. And then you do have to say that Kyrie comes back <laughs> and, and then you're looking at it, you're like, um, so first, one of the things that occurred to me was that if I was Kevin Durant and I came to play with Kyrie Irving in part because they signed together and then Kyrie goes missing for a significant number of games. I mean, I, I feel like he missed, uh, uh, like over five games, I think. Um, like I, I had to say that, like I feel like I might be bent out of shape. Like if I sign with a team and uh, and then like my you know my my co-signer um, uh, wasn't there, and then James Harden shows up and like you you know you go b- way back with him. That team looked really really strong. And then Kyrie coming back, Kyrie's super talented, um, but it it did seem like uh, like there was an, another adjustment uh, that has to be made. For sure. And I think it's going to take time for the these guys all to build chemistry, even before the Harden trade. It takes time. I mean, they started 9-8. and eight. The 2010-11 Miami Heat started 9-8. and eight. And sometimes you got to lose or go through you know, some bumps before you become the team that you, you have the potential to be in. With this Nets team, with Kyrie taking that time off for personal reasons, he stated that he you know, didn't really want to get into. I'm sure that is tough you know, when that whole team is bought in and sacrificing in their own respective ways. Um, but ultimately, Katie and Kyrie, the fact those guys chose to play together, you know, says a lot about their relationship and their ability to to get through any difficult times. And I think the fact that Harden wanted to go there and his relationship with KD, KD is going to serve as kind of, I think, that like connective glue on the team. He's not necessarily like a traditional, you know, throwback leader. He's not like a guy who yells at people like Michael Jordan. He's not the LeBron type of leader. But for this team, a star power team. I think KD can keep these guys together through a time like this and losing two games versus Cleveland. This kind of like, this feels like a wake up call in some ways. Cause you got the Cavs that like this team just fights so hard. They have every guy on that roster is trying everything they can to win games. And, and Steve Nash said after I think Friday's game, he's like, you know, we, we're not a defensive team. We have to, you know, overcome that through effort and, and hard work and communication. And, you know, maybe for the nets, it could be a good thing for them to drop some of these games here because it's going to show the amount of effort they get to put into the defensive end. They can't just outscore everybody, even though they're going to put up a lot of points and that's what they're going to really, you know, win or lose with is scoring, but their defense does need to be better. And that's my concern with them for sure. So, so you say a hundred times out of a hundred, you make this trade and I agree. Um, you know, they're in it to win it. Now it's clear, like it's, it's title contention or bust. Um, which I appreciate because I, I think that anytime a team goes for it in this way, you kind of have to give them credit. Uh, like, you know, I, I think um, maximizing your uh, chances of winning a title when you're close to it is the right thing to do. And a, a lot of teams um, maybe don't take that level of uh, commitment or, or investment. So so you do it. Fantastic. Um you do have some concerns, I agree, and like the Cavs uh, games sort of spoke to it. Where you look at the roster, and Steve Nash said, "This is not a defensive roster." Um, so even though you make the trade a uh, hundred times out of a hundred times, Kevin, and you were very optimistic about the Nets pre-trade, you were like, "Look, yeah, these yeah. guys could could uh, win the East and make it to the finals and play probably the Lakers." <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> 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 look at this stuff. Um, uh, you feel the same way uh, now having uh, gotten a little bit more like uh, exposure to them on the court? Definitely. And, and you know, I think that Bucks game, the game they won, granted, you know, no Kyrie, I feel like that game showed the upside here because this team, like, you know, their offense has the potential to be like an all time offense like when, when have we ever seen three creative genius scorers, you know, with their level of talent 
be put together on the same roster. Like they can play off ball. They've played with other stars in their past. Katie, obviously you mentioned playing with Harden prior, you know, Kyrie playing with LeBron and Katie going to Golden State, all the stars, you know, Harden played with in Houston. These guys can can make things work. And you have guys like Joe Harris, who is just going to get countless open shots and he doesn't need to be open to drain threes. This offense is going to be ridiculous. And with their defense, you know, when it comes to wanting to do this trade a hundred times out of a hundred, you raise your ceiling and you probably, you know, make your defense worse, but it's not like Kyrie in some of those finals runs with the Cavs didn't show that when he's really given a hundred percent that he can be a really good defensive player at the guard spot for you. It's not like KD at his peak, you know, is, is not one of the greatest defenders we haven't seen when he was playing the five for the Warriors. He can really elevate his play and Harden, once a guy who people rip for playing poor defense has become a really solid defender. He's especially like good on switches against some bigger guys. So the Nets, like to me, I look at that team and it's like they need help around the edges with some of their other wing uh, players with depth, you know, finding another big. They just signed Pell, who should help a little bit, you know, behind DeAndre Jordan. But finding one more guy to me can help raise the the floor of the team like it's a defensive unit. And, you know, their ceiling is not just, you know, one finals it's multiple and obviously it's hard to do that and need a lot of luck along the way too but having these guys together like could just lead to some obscene offense with still pretty good defense with the right guys around them are there any available role players because i know there's some free agents floating around too like uh, it like that you think the nets are either are looking at or should look at you know i had a conversation with an exec this week about that and and because we were talking about the Nets, so it's like who do you think they would look for who are the guys out there and what they said to me was this because of the league's new rules with the play in tournament, which means so normally in the NBA playoffs, eight teams in each conference, 16 total make the postseason. This year, there will be the seven, eight, nine, and 10 seed that get to play multiple games for the seven and eight spot. And the fact that you have more teams that have a chance to get that 10 spot, uh, that means more teams have reason to win, less reason to let go of players. Players have more reason to be bought in and, and so on and so forth, which could mean that there's not going to be a lot of players available for a team like the Nets to go out there and get like we saw the Lakers get with Markeith Morris last year, like we've seen with other you know teams with championship hopes get in the past. Because, you know, people around the like, people around the league say the Nets are hoping that Andre Drummond, the Cavs center, gets bought out. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's what people say they're hoping for. But that's unlikely. Like, it's just it's so unlikely because Cleveland's in it. You know, they're in it partially because they're pretty good, but also because they have more playoff spots to get in, you know? So we might not see a lot of options out there, which is, you know, I'm not really answering your question, but like, I don't know if there will be many options. This could be a really limited buyout period and like they don't have any picks. So there's not much they can trade to actually get somebody in return. Maybe a JJ Reddick, somebody like that from the Pelicans. That's one what? name. I'll throw out there. Yeah, JJ, <laughs> I'm serious. Like JJ Reddick is one name I'll throw out there. JJ can stroke some threes for you. That would be a great put JJ. I mean, I mean, that'd be incredible, but yeah. like, I feel like JJ is way out of their reach. I, I, I was like thinking of folks that, you know, might actually be available. <laughs> JJ <laughs> could like, be. I mean, like, Pelicans are bad right now. They were bad. Really struggling. Oh, but they need more more JJs, not fewer JJs. I mean, the right. thing is like shooting. <laughs> You're right. Though I will say this, JJ, a free agent this coming off season, maybe the Pelicans would think, let's get something, you know, in return. JJ's from, you know, really not from Brooklyn, but lives in Brooklyn with his family. It would make sense, you know, to. Wow, you're planting some seeds. Well, yeah, so, I mean, I when like I think it. about the Nets too, though, it's like, I feel like, at least this is like the thinking you have. So you've got uh, the three stars, Joe Harris, DeAndre Jordan, um, and, and like what you think is you need some gritty role players who'll just go out there and throw their bodies around and pass the ball to one of the three stars. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Get out like, of the way. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, you know, you also got Jeff Green, who, yeah. you know, I think is going to be like hugely important on this team, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then I like I look up and I'm just like, who the heck do they get that kind of fits that gritty role playing mold? who will just like do his thing and like, you know, like like not um, I like I, I mean, and this is just me throwing something out here. This probably doesn't fit. But like a P.J. Tucker type yeah. will just go and like that's a good one. P.J. Tucker's a great, great example of what they should be going for, because then like you can play him with Jeff Green. And play that, or and Kevin Durant have switchability and still have really good defense out on the court. That that makes perfect sense. And you know, I reported on the Ringer a couple of weeks back that you know the demand for PJ Tucker sounds like three second round draft picks, 
which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know there are a lot of people around the league who think it is because he's 35 years old, because he's going to be a free agent this off season, and because you know you know outside of the offense without Harden, let's see what he looks like. Granted, if he were going to Brooklyn, he would be with Harden again and be with other stars and playing off of them. So that guy that makes perfect sense for the Nets. I, I like that idea. I think him or Redick or both. How about that? <laughs> I'm just thinking about like also like the street freed agents who are like out there still like uh, like Iman Shumpert as an example like just throw Shumpert out there and have him like you know Jamal Crawford guys like that bring know? back Jamal Crawford <laughs> why not <laughs> <laughs> exactly I mean it's true there are there are some solid vets out there that could be worth an, an addition but uh, ultimately like the Norvell Pell signing is sort of along the lines of what you're saying that it and, is along you, those you know, lines and, and he, you know it may, we'll see if he sticks or not he was pretty good with Philly last year in a real limited role uh and when other guys were out but you know that's what we're probably looking at in, in all likelihood for the nets in terms of what they can add but maybe like i said like a reddick or maybe a pj tucker one of those guys could pop up um but we'll see how the market develops it's, it could be a weird year with trades in the buyout market man if they were to get drummond i mean that would be like freaking epic you know i mean I, like <laughs> that's way beyond what, 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 what I, I, don't, I, was I don't see it happen personally but i mean it's just you know people around the league say the nets are hoping he gets bought out which we'll see because his trade market when he was with detroit was so limited they had a hard time finding anybody that would take him and it's not like even though he's having a solid season much would change there but i i do think I do think that there would be enough interest that one team would at least take him on for the rest of the season. We wouldn't see a bio, but who knows? Who knows? Crazier things have happened in the NBA. That's for sure. Including James Harden getting paired with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. <laughs> so, so I'd say like the big thing a lot of us are thinking is that this, this team seems like a chemistry um, exercise or experiment. Now um, conventional wisdom is that if you have three stars, one of them needs to sacrifice a bit. Um, and, and it feels like Kyrie is the natural candidate to sacrifice somehow, maybe because uh, of um, Harden and Durant's pre-existing relationship or like his relative, um, you know, uh, like size or, or, or something like for whatever reason, it just feels like that. They're MVPs, um, and, you know. And, and then it also feels like um, like this, like the the chemistry element is going to be key in that Steve Nash is like the obviously the the. Um, key figure in trying to manage that chemistry like am i the only person who feels like the these two things <laughs> <laughs> no i mean it's definitely a big experiment here and you know everything i said earlier about these guys they they could sacrifice and they can fit because they have in the past it doesn't mean it would work you know circumstances change relationships change and and maybe the mix just doesn't work you know maybe they lose and these guys clash who knows what the future brings but you know it's still at the end of the day, it's a hundred percent everything you're saying that putting these level of stars together who, you know, are often isolationists, you know, you've given the ball, they run a pick and roll, the defense switches, and then they are on an Island. It's one-on-one. -on -one, it's like at the park. And that, that can be hard. Sometimes it can feel like your turn, my turn uh, in terms of, you know, now it's Katie's turn. Now it's Kyrie's turn. Now it's Harden's turn. And, and sometimes that can lead to, lead to stagnant offense. But ultimately I feel like, James Harden, when he was in Houston, the last, you know, four or five years, he became that, you know, ISO player, that guy who's, you know, dominating the ball. But when he was in OKC, he could run off screens and he could run off of handoffs and not have the ball in his hands and still be a threat. And KD himself went to Golden State, improved as a passer, became a guy who played even more off ball than he did in OKC. I feel like those guys have shown a willingness to do that when it comes to competing for championships and that they can do it again here. And ultimately with Brooklyn and Steve Nash, especially it's going to be on him as the head coach and that whole coaching staff to put these players in positions to succeed. And then for the players to play with the effort necessarily necessary on defense to complement what will be a high scoring offense. Like this offense is going to get up, put up points. Like, it's up to the stars to bring in that defensive mindset to me more so than the offensive sacrifice. Like they get to be the leaders of the defense and we'll see. I mean, it's a, it's a long season, but I think they can. Interesting. Um, and so it's like a defensive sacrifice more than an offensive yeah. sacrifice that you, you think is being called for. I think Steve Nash might agree with you. I mean, it's, it's like the type of thing where let's say you're not getting, you know, 
X amount of possessions per game, 30 possessions instead of getting 20. You got to put that energy you would put into those extra 10 possessions into defense. You know, it, it, that, that's what needs to happen. And Kyrie, I'll say this, like before his hiatus away from the court, when he opened the season, the first couple of games, he was really busting his butt on defense. He was setting a tone for the team and it looked like playoff Kyrie. And I don't expect that over the full regular season, he's probably going to coast at certain points as you should, when you might be playing into the finals. But if he's able to turn back to that level in the playoffs, like we've seen him do in the past, I have a hard time seeing anybody beating the nets in the Eastern conference. Like the bucks have too many holes. Some of these other teams have so many holes. I feel like it could be competitive against the Celtics. It could be competitive against the bucks and you know, the Sixers, but I still feel like the nets have higher upside um, than any of these teams. Wow. You heard it here. Everyone, <laughs> Kevin O'Connor is picking the most fascinating team. Go Brooklyn, <laughs> go Steve Nash. I mean, I, I've got, a, I mean, I'm a fan of a lot of folks associated with this team. I want Steve Nash to succeed. Mm. Um, so I hope you are right. My friend, maybe we'll have you back to talk about uh, what goes on a little bit later in the season. But thank you for shedding light on the Knicks, the Nets, the Knicks. What's going on with these teams? Uh, very high level. Um, really excited for you to be proven right. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hope so, Andrew. It's, it, it's uh, going to be fun to see these two teams develop. It's been fun to watch them so far. Yeah, well, thank you for, for, for your insight. Um, anyone who wants to follow Kevin's NBA commentary, uh, it's the ringer.com. And you have a bunch of stuff going on, right? Yeah, so I host a couple of podcasts, The Mismatch with Chris Vernon on Tuesdays, Fridays. And then I host a pod on Wednesday, every other Wednesday on the Ringer NBA show feed called Ringer NBA Universe, where we talk about a lot of the young guys in the league. Well, that's a, that's a podcast we'll talk a lot about, the Knicks, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, I write on the website, The Ringer, and do videos and podcasts there. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's been a good season so far, despite the challenges with corona and everything going on kevin o'connor is where i go to get smarter about the nba you guys should do the same <laughs> uh really like and, and if you look at it he made his bones uh being a draft guru dissecting prospects uh so you know like he he's seen these folks uh, develop thank you so much kevin this is a blast and thank you andrew and good luck thank you for doing all you do thank you man appreciate the heck out of you <laughs>